welcome, welcome everybody to this session of the Purva Tab Hang Center and the webinars that started some time ago, or some uh, four sessions ago. And so far, here uh, we have been very successful in getting your attention out. Today, um, uh, I will present on perilunate and axial dislocations of the wrist, which is a subject that uh, it's a hot one, but uh, fortunately, it's not a very frequent condition. It's not very common. So, uh, without any other any other problem, uh, let's see if we can advance. Well, fracture dislocations of the wrist are common among young individuals, are not common among aged individuals, and much less in those with bone stock problems, usually mostly male in a ratio of a two to one, um, is uh, more or less this is the curve that we would expect to have uh, on uh, dislocations. These uh, curves are actually uh, on the fractures. On the fracture side, you can see on the left-hand side that we have high energy trauma. In the, in the young, it's where you expect to have those, uh, those uh, dislocations as well. Um, the incidence uh, has been calculated in many places, and this comes from, from Norway, more or less. It's a place that uh, they have a long experience, epidemiology experience, and they talk about 37 carpal fracture dislocations per 100,000 inhabitants per year. That means that uh, for every uh, year, uh, you'll have 110 wrist injuries for 100,000 persons. That includes, of course, and the vast majority of them are distal radial fractures, 73 in this case, and uh, 35 carpal fractures. So that means that two dislocations, it's only 1.7% of, uh, of the injuries uh, that uh, tend to have uh, any 100,000 persons per year. Uh, the thing is that uh, most often they are underestimated or missed. Uh, those are injuries that uh, it's amazing that they can be missed uh, because there's such a destroy, destroyed articulation inside that it's amazing that they can be missed. But it's not amazing if you look at the uh, perilunate dislocations. This is a perilunate dislocation. And um, the lunate is a, a triangle a shape. That means that it's dislocated. And here you can see that only seven months after, still is dislocated. And the patient was doing very well. Even though uh, if you look on the, on the, on the far right, uh, on, on the right top, top the uh, image, you will see that the, the that lunate is dislocated, I'm impinging, impinging the flexor tendon and median nerve. It's amazing that this guy went uh, this way until uh, uh, she was seen by Dr. Silvia Lopez, uh, a former fellow of us that uh, asked me uh, the, my help and, and we found the, 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 the lunate, as you can see, in the floor of the carpal tunnel. Uh, another common ground on most of these injuries that are, as you know, those bones are irregularly vascularized, problem with necrosis is not unusual, and particularly in those cases where there is an, an apparently, apparently benign injury, but that has stopped all intraosseous vascularization of the proximal pole. And then you have necrosis of the scaphoid, obviously, and you have that evolution in only three months the proximal pole was uh, disgraced with that necrosis. Malradius on the other side, um, it's, not, uh, it's not rare because in joint incongruity may result in osteoarthritis. Uh, it's important to reduce all of those, uh, particularly all those uh, articular contacts that they have so much motion uh, that, that uh, if they fail, the, uh, if you fail to produce a, a regular congruent articulation, you may have that osteoarthritis that you see here on this piece of tricuital osteoarthritis thing. This patient may be really desperate for pain, trying, trying to find a solution for that pain when it was so easy. You only had to reduce uh, that, that articulation or just uh, to um, produce uh, a good reduction. Associated ligament injury is common. Although it's important to say that even though it's so common to have ligaments and capsule disruptions like this in cases like this one, this is a perilunate dislocation. And we can see here in the arrow, in the yellow arrow, we can see the lunatral quittal dorsal ligament completely disrupted. 
and we can see uh, how much damage there is. Uh, and I say that uh, it's not it's not a problem a ligament injury because most likely than not all those cases that end up uh, being stiff, not unstable. Instability is less likely, it's less a problem than uh, stiffness. As you can see in this case, uh, soft tissue injury is what uh, explains why the, the wrist uh, was uh, left uh, with that uh, stiffness and most likely than not, uh, instability will not ne never be the problem. So, um, this, uh, so far we have seen the common ground that we have. And then we'll have to discuss the different types of dislocations. And obviously we will not cover, but it's impossible. It would be almost boring. I will uh, do some, some um, pass on to you some, some ideas on peroneal dislocations, on axial dislocations as well. And then in the end, we'll, we'll make a little bit of epilogue to discuss high energy trauma to the wrist, whether that's really, really, um, really the, um, the problem or if uh, we should find solutions for high energy trauma that are more uh, meaningful. Okay, so let's start perilunar dislocations. Everybody knows uh, perilunar dislocations is that uh, situation in which the lunate is the one that uh, could not move away from the radius, while the rest of the carpus dislocated uh, dorsally or palmally, usually dorsally, about a, a lesser arc that was described by uh, Dr. Johnson. The lesser arc uh, perilunate uh, uh, and the greater arc between the two arcs is the, the soft or the weakened uh, zone through which most perilunate dislocations occur. Between the greater arc, the lesser arc, we have a bunch of uh, possibilities of, uh, and that's what uh, we are gonna be talking about. We all have seen and remember the Mayfall and Johnson Kilcoin uh, presentation in 1980. Well, not most uh, of you remember that, but as a matter of fact, they did uh, the great job. The seminal work was done by them. And they say that actually there are so many clinical forms that it's amazing to see that uh, most of them are linked to another. So it just states uh, the, it just states the um, destabilization pattern or occurs, and uh, of which the first uh, the first uh, phase would be escape net dissociation, and then you would see a dorsal peroneal dislocation occurring. To third, uh, you you need the lunotropical dissociation before the lunate remains uh, alone. And then the rest of the carpus is the one that pushes the lunate palm outwards. But let's let, let's uh, go to the path mechanics of this uh, condition and see what we can tell or more detail of uh, about these path mechanics. These are the, the crazy guys that usually are bound to be our our patients. Uh, climbing, so the solo climbing has uh, providing us a, a lot of work and also those mountain biking and all those things. Although uh, all of them have in common, the fact that most uh, have felt fallen from height, uh, precipitations, head-on collusions, motorbike accidents, etc. Uh, there's always that push uh, type of uh, extension uh, mechanism that, that that's uh, fall, fallen on the outstretched hand. Aside from extension and some radial inclination, there's a, there's a need for some pronosupination as well. And uh, I would like to make a little comment here because uh, we are confused. Uh, we're confusing many people when we when we use the terms pronosupination intracarpal. Uh, why is that? Because uh, usually we tend to believe that the hand is the mobile uh, joint and the forearm is the rigid joint uh, about which we move. But in this case, it's different. The hand usually is blocked at the time of the impact. Uh, that hand will be blocked on the floor the, the, and it's the body, the flying body, the one that pivots on the top of the wrist, the one that produces that intercapital rotation. So based on that, we should understand that whenever we say forearm supination, the forearm may supinate, but in fact, what we have inside of the carpus is an intercapital pronation. And similarly, if you have a forearm pronation, again, resistance, meaning that it's a for forearm pronation isometric, what you have is intracarpal supination. 
And that probably is the confusing thing that we had when we said that uh, for a periodic late dislocation to occur, we need extension, we need uh, only deviation or radial deviation, and we need supination. No, in fact, what we need is intercarp pronation, which is the action that, uh, that occurs within the wrist when the uh, forearm supinates against resistance. Again, the moving body here is the body, and the hand is fixed on the floor, resisting all the torques and all the forces coming. What the structures are there to, the, to, um, to neutralize the, the, those forces? Well, we have the dorsal scapulonal ligament. It's a, it's a ligament that we know very well from the first, uh, from the first presentation, but also from, from, uh, from our knowledge. We know that the scapulonal ligament is important. The volar radial lunar ligaments are the ones that maintain that the stability or that the connection between the lunate and radius. And distally, we have the STT and SC ligaments that connect the, the scaphoid to the distal row, and as well as the, the other ligaments that could uh, be found between the triquitrum, hamate, and capitate, palmoli. And those ligaments are the one, one extends the scaphoid, the other one resists extension of the, of the lunate. And it is uh, at a certain point of these, um, these opposite forces that uh, we have, a, uh, we do have a starting that process of. Uh, of rupture that comes usually from volo to dorsal, although the other day we were discussing about the possibility of uh, having the reverse the, from dorsal to volo. Once all the ligaments have been disrupted, the uh, volo and dorsal scaphoid ligament, then this scaphoid behaves as if it was a distal uh, bone of the distal row. And as the distal row rotates, uh, you have that obvious, you have that extension about the dorsal edge of the lunate bone, and the lunate bone is there just to injure or to produce some injury to the proximal pole of the capitate, which will be very seldom visible. But it's an important feature that, as, as you will see later on, is something that we should look at. Again, uh, still we have the, the volar ligament uh, connecting the lunate to the radius intact, and the distal connection of the scaphoid to the distal row intact. We have a little bit more now in this uh, schematic representation. I included the triquitrum because the triquitrum at this moment uh, is more connected to the distal row as well because of the triquitrum hamate capitale ligament, those strong ligaments, the palmami carpal ligament that they say. And this is the ligament that is uh, the one that pulls the triquitrum away from the lunate. And that explains the stage three here that we have the lunotriquitral dissociation. But the lunate still is, the, is there, just attached to the radius, through the volar ligaments, radial lunate ligaments, both the short and long radial lunate ligaments that need to be intact for these uh, to occur. On the other side, we have the radius cave for capitate ligament that connects the radial styloid to the capitate. And this has an obliquity that allows all this dislocation to occur and without having unnecessarily to rupture. And then, of course, uh, that has passed some several uh, milliseconds of, uh, of the problem, and, and there's the reactivation of all, all, the, the, all the muscles contraction. All the muscles contract, and also the contract uh, are there just to block the articulation, and that's blocking the articulation, the one that uh, do not allow, once the, the motion is uh, recovered, once the patient uh, is already suffering pain, but, but now they try just to compensate by just flexing the wrist. And as you flex the wrist, then you have the capitate is the one that uh, I like and impinges the, the lunate, palm wood. Still the, the lunate is uh, retained by the, the volar radial lunate ligament, but palm wood is the one that the capitate is the one that uh, gets into the place and it's uh, enucleating it's putting the lunate aside and dislocates the lunate. The lunate has nothing very different from before, except the fact that it's rotated, but anything else it's normal. I mean, the volar ligaments and the capsule and the short radial lunate and long radial lunate ligaments are still there. But now what we have is a problem with the scaphoid. The scaphoid subluxes dorsally, and usually that's the final end of that perilunate dislocation 
that ended up in alunate at this location. This is a classification by Apergis, uh, our friend from, uh, from Athens, in which uh, he described this classification depending on how much rotation there was on the lunate relative to the capitate. But in this case, uh, he was uh, mentioning the fact that uh, sometimes the lunate has no problems because uh, in uh, stage one, uh, he's got uh, uh, volar and dorsal ligaments intact. And then the 2A, it's one that the dorsal ligament that it's not very important as a matter of fact, is disrupted, but still the lunate is uh, well-placed, is the capitate that it's uh, subluxed. Uh, the 2B would be a situation where the capitate has recovered its normal articulation with the distal radius and now the lunate is rotated. It may be rotated up to 90 degrees and to 180 degrees, but as long as the volar ligament is there, no thing happens. And then the 2C would be the situation where the, the lunate has been completely extruded and because of the violence of the accident has disrupted all the ligaments, bullet and dorsal. Uh, what happens if we have a situation where we have extension, we have a radial deviation now instead of ulnar deviation and we still have pronation, interarticular pronation. Well, in those cases, the same happens in the same that uh, we have a scaphonal ligaments, radiolunar ligaments, fuller. We have the STT and SC ligaments, fuller capsular ligaments, are very strong, the ones that pull the scaphoid. But the, in this situation, because of uh, radial deviation, the proximal pole becomes blocked uh, by the ligaments, the, the volar ligaments, the radioscaphoid capital ligament. And this is the one that blocks that and produces a bending fracture of the scaphoid and the scaphoid fractures and uh, propagates a situation where there is a uh, instability and on the fracture side and then uh, the distal scaphoid follows the distal wall and the proximal scaphoid remains attached, normally attached to the lunate as, as we have seen before. And now then you have all those one, two A, two B and two C situations in which in this case would not be only uh, the lunate, but also the proximal pole of a scaphoid, the one that retains its position in 2A, the one that uh, rotates to the, with, uh, with the lunate in 2B, and then the one that, that dislocates palmally and this um, proximally in uh, 2C. Well, there's another situation that sometimes uh, you may have uh, extension also, but now you have supination. Supination, that would be the typical case when you are falling backwards with the hand uh, uh, at the back and, and you land on the hand and the hand is uh, slightly only deviated, but then you have intercapal supination instead of pronation. In those cases, what you want to have found is that situation that we discussed the other day when we were talking about ulnar site instabilities of the wrist in which the lunatory quitro fails first and then you have that propagation from the ulnar aspect of the wrist into the, the perilunate uh, zone. And as opposed to the direct perilunate dislocation, the last one, it will be a reverse perilunate dislocation. It's an eventuality that it's uh, there more often than we thought, except that uh, since the scaphoid remains in its place and the violence uh, in those cases that very seldom uh, disrupts uh, the scaphoid, most, uh, most often the, these cases remain as a lunar tracheal dissociation without having more impact than that. So uh, to clarify a little bit the, the three options that I found, extension ulnar inclination, intracarpal pronation, that's the usual uh, mechanism producing escape from dissociation. Uh, if it progresses, it will go into a dorsal perilunate dislocation or retrolunate dislocation, that some people like to call it. Uh, that if you follow, you may get uh, end up as a third uh, stage or third phase lunatorapital dissociation. And the fourth would be the volar dislocation of the lunate. If instead of uh, uh, ulnar inclination, you have radial inclination, you may have a scaphoid fracture and the dorsal scaphoid perilunate dislocation and the volar dislocation of the proximal scaphoid and lunate. And finally, we have extension on an inclination and uh, intracarpal supination. Then what you would expect is lunatorical dissociation, but not as the first uh, phase as before, but as the first phase 
followed by a reverse perilunate dislocation. How to diagnose all of this? Well, I think that uh, as long as we understand well that these, um, these graphics are, are quite illustrative of uh, the schematic representation of more or less the area of, uh, through which the disruption occurs. There's, um, there's um, the outer, outer perilunate fracture dislocations. Uh, the, there is that, that perilunate uh, um, arc, the greater arc that uh, Dr. Johnson was describing, as we mentioned before. And then we have the perilunate dislocation in which there are no fractures but uh, it goes uh, just around the scaphoid into the mid-carpal and then it comes back into the lunar triquetral articulation. Uh, usually we use the, the prefix trans to indicate the fracture and the prefix peri to indicate the dislocation. And uh, with this trick, uh, we can describe almost any single um, situation that we may find. This would be a pure perilunate dislocation Look at that uh, on the left, we can see that the lunate is triangular shape. It's typically whenever we have a lunate triangular shape in this place and it's, an, and it's a triangle like that. This is a typical perilunate dislocation. Everything else is almost normal. And then to the right, we can see that the outlines of the situation with the typical uh, spilled, uh, uh, spilled cup, uh, teacup, Spill teacup uh, means that it's a cup that has no contains, that has been emptied uh, because the capitate is not uh, occupying its space there. It's a perilunate dislocation for sure. So uh, if you find that the triangular shape uh, lunate and you have also that the spill teacup uh, on the other side, you have for sure that this is a perilunate dislocation. This is a transescape for perilunate dislocation. Uh, why? Well, because we have the spill teacup uh, sign there, but also because we can see the lunate has uh, that triangular shape. And then we have something that I like to call the butterfly sign. Because typically whenever the, the scaphoid is uh, displaced, in those cases, what you can see is that the, it has like the two wings of a butterfly uh, about to, to fly, uh, those are quite typical in those situations. Can you see that now? Yes, it's easy, the butterfly sign. And that's why we can uh, identify those cases uh, by saying this is a transescaphoid perilunate dislocation. Um, more complex as you, can, as you may find, uh, you will see that there is a butterfly sign over there. That means that there is a transescaphoid perilunate dislocation. The lunate is also pointy, uh, it's a triangular shape. And then we have something else that uh, comes to us is that we can see that the capitate, the capitate has a rough surface proximally, a rough safe, well, this is the butterfly sign and we have uh, an irregular proximal contour of the capitate. And that means that the proximal uh, head of the capitate must be somewhere. And usually this is the phantom type of a peril, uh, transcapitate peronate dislocation together with the transescaphoid transcapitate peronate fracture dislocation. This is a typical example of a compound, uh, a combined uh, complex injury that can be analyzed quite substantially well. And they all follow that pattern of a butterfly sign, spilled a teacup as well. And in this case, we have that proximal capitate dislocated. Scape for capitate dislocation, it's not to be dislocated or quite often it's not dislocated when, when we arrive um, and we can see that uh, there is a fracture of the scape for it and also the, the proximal pole of the capitate and in those cases may have happened what the Fenton, Dr. Fenton described as a um, rotation 180 degrees of the proximal pole of the capitate and remains like that. And obviously then the rough surface of the fracture is facing the lunate. And if you cannot identify that, if you cannot know, know that there is there, that, that's a real, real problem. But these uh, can be also dislocated, in which case, yeah, you have that. Traction views. It's interesting that uh, David Green always uh, insists on that. 
insists that the, all these patients need to be taken x-rays on traction. On traction, you can see not only uh, the fragments, but also if there is any little fragment uh, inside of the joint. You can see how much the scape foot uh, displaces distally relative to the lunate. And uh, it's the scapular stretch test that was described in 1998 by Yamaguchi. Uh, by using that, uh, we can uh, see that there are other very rare, rare combinations of injury. One would be the perilunate axial radial dislocation. It's a perilunate dislocation that started regularly as it does uh, between the scaphoid and the, and the radius, and then produces a scaphoid dissociation. And that instead of going back approximately through uh, following the lunotracheal joint, it just remains distal and produces an axial dislocation, the type that we will be seeing after this talk. And then uh, there is another one, uh, it's also quite uncommon, the fact that uh, not only the, the lunate is bypassed, sometimes the lunate is, um, is the, uh, disrupted. And in those cases, we can have a translunate fracture dislocation as um, uh, Dr. Bain, Greg Bain from, from Australia has uh, put up uh, very well, uh, he's described that. This would be a perilunate axial radial dislocation variant. You can see that there is that, that uh, sliding of the capitate relative to the heme, um, together with the scaphoid and the radial side, that's, that's an axial radial dislocation. Another case that was published some time ago by, by, by Bill Cooney, again, uh, uh, you have that proximal migration of capitate, uh, trapezoid, trapezium, scaphoid altogether have migrated proximally, while the, the lunate and the rest of the carpus, the ulnar side of the carpus remains unstable out there. Those are translunate fracture dislocations. You can see this case, and you can see another case where there is a fracture dislocation. Uh, and because they, they, um, they have that uh, different, uh, different pattern that it's quite unusual to have the lunate fracture, those are quite missed, uh, many, many times are missed, the presentation, and we don't know what's happening. The fact is that uh, uh, is the, the best definition I can tell you on the volar dislocation of the, the mid-carpal joint together with um, a volar uh, type of uh, fracture of the, of the scaphoid. Eh? Excuse me, my granddaughter. <laughs> well, um, good timing uh, for treatment. Uh, how to treat this? Uh, is there any common ground on treatment? Oh, well, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, all of those have the com in common that they need to be reduced automatically as soon as possible. As soon as possible, the reduction needs to be done. Otherwise, we can have all sorts of problems because of that delay. If they are delayed, of course, because there are other conditions, I can understand that, but all the dislocations need to be reduced. Another thing is that they need to be at three o'clock a.m. in the morning. They need to be, um, they need to be uh, fixed or, or definitely treated, but at least the dislocation needs to be done. Uh, this location, it can be reduced accordingly to Tavernier. That was a very old, uh, old uh, um, fellow of uh, Dr. Disto. Uh, he described uh, that technique, which consists on basically applying traction long, long enough as for the muscles, the muscles that uh, are um, are not allowing the, the dislocation to, to get in. Uh, long, long, prolonged uh, traction and then you have that with the thumb, you have that counter phalanx, the counterpoint that you are aiming to the lunate, and then you are flexing distally the, 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 uh, the capitate and the, and the mericarpal to reduce that, that, uh, that dislocation. This is the typical reduction. The tavernier, there is only one secret is that you have to, to have complete relaxation of the patient. And usually what I advise is that uh, whenever I see a patient like this in the OR, uh, in the emergency room, to place uh, just uh, a quick rapid um, uh, local anesthesia, axillary block anesthesia, to have the patient relax, and then probably you'll, you'll succeed on reducing that. 
That it means that there are other techniques. The hyperacus power is this one. It's based basically on, on the fact that uh, if you block the lunate, you only have to do that pronation, uh, that supination, excuse me, that supination to reduce the scaphoid uh, to the lunate. It's based not as much on the extension uh, being reduced uh, into flexion, but on that supination uh, rotation torque that you apply to reduce that. Uh, if it's a chronic case, uh, Dr. Botellero from, from Lisbon uh, published the, the fact of using external fixators that are kept uh, sometimes two, three days until there is enough uh, space for the perilunate dislocation to, to uh, redu be reduced. What about percutaneous fixation? Well, I don't believe that uh, in the old time or the old style type of uh, reduction can be uh, of any of any uh, value of that because uh, you play that K wire, you are satisfied, you go home. But then in four months, whenever you remove that K wire, uh, it springs back into a uh, displaced uh, scaphoid dissociation. This should not be allowed nowadays. Uh, why? Because uh, whenever the dorsal scaphoid ligament is, as you can see here, uh, normal, the tendency of the scaphoid is uh, towards flexion and pronation, and the lunate towards uh, extending. And no matter how, unless the, the tips of the of the remnants, the remnants of those uh, ligaments are in contact, or you will not be able to do uh, to have uh, enough uh, scar tissue as to produce a stable situation. That's why those those uh, situations cannot be treated. Uh, to me, I think that arthroscopy reduction and fixation of the peroneal dislocations is the, the way to go in the future. Will most of them will be treated this way? Uh, if the patient comes with some some difficulties on that, then you may, uh, of course, you may go for palmar and dorsal approaches, or sometimes just with uh, with the dorsal approach enough would be enough as long as you have that. Uh, arthroscopy controlled um, uh, checking of the reduction. And most of them, it's checking whether the ligaments that need to be importantly touching one to each other are really in contact. Um, well, this is a case of a, a dual a double uh, approach that uh, we were keen on doing uh, some time ago. This is the Palmer approach. Uh, the ulnar nerve and ulnar artery and Guillaume canal is there. I open that. I can see inside of the of the carpal tunnel with all the flux tendons and the median nerve that is emerging there. And also by the uh, ulnar artery, we have the ulnar nerve also. And then uh, this is the usual uh, picture that everybody has uh, of a distal surface of the lunate that it's. Uh, emerging into that rent. That rent is nothing but the space of quarry that has also disrupted the lunotriquitral volar ligament. And the distal articulation uh, you can see here that can be reduced. And this is the, the, the scape with the one that gets uh, reduced now. And once you have that, that then you, you need to, to be able to uh, produce a good suture of the volar lunotriquitral ligament because the lunotrochytral ligament is very stout, strong, and thick, and allows you to do some, some sort of suture, that the suture by itself will be very stable indeed. The radius cave for capital ligament in this uh, drawing has shown displaced and disrupted. Usually it's never like that disrupted, but sometimes uh, you may achieve some more some more uh, stability by just reinforcing that uh, distended uh, ligament uh, to each other. This is a picture where you, you can see that the, we are suturing the lunotriquitral volar ligament. And the space of Poirier needs not to be closed by sutures. Usually it's the brand that uh, everybody shows that there is a brand, a J type of um, of rent, uh, a big, big, big uh, injury that, that we believe that needs to be sutured. As a matter of fact, it is not. It has been uh, obviously open, and uh, you may uh, use some some uh, non-absorbent sutures, but but needs not to be uh, understood as, as a pathological uh, feature. The space of body is there, and every single person. 
And then on the on the back, we are using this just to check on the on the reduction of the bones. And then we are placing uh, placing K wires or whatever we feel like uh, that we need uh, for providing stability. Uh, usually, my advice is always to uh, place the uh, K wires never vertical. Uh, each bone needs to be fixed to its neighbor in the same floor. The lunate towards the scaphoid, the scaphoid towards uh, the lunate, and the lunate towards the tracheotum, but never to produce uh, uh, to jump uh, from the the scaphoid into the capitate. Well, never, no. Uh, if there is a site, uh, it depends on how much destruction you find. Depends on that. This is a case of perilonate dislocation that it was almost uh, no. Uh, no doubt that it was dislocated, particularly when we saw that that cut. It's a cut that goes across the capitate into the lunate. Now here you can see seven months uh, down the line after the, after the reduction had been achieved, and the X-rays uh, look like this. And 60 months post surgery, he was doing very well. As you can see, it moves flexion extension quite well in both directions. This is uh, some, some work done uh, by the Japanese uh, that they, um, they presented this work based on 32 patients in which uh, if the scaphoid ligament was further repaired, aside from reduced, they had much better function than if they, it was not repaired. Whether or not you can be able to, to repair that, uh, it depends on how, how disrupted it is. Um, if there is instead of a, a scaphoid dissociation, there is a scaphoid fracture, then the dorsal fragment and the, the dorsal approach is uh, ideal to produce a good fixation with K wires or a Hebler screw that, that will be much, much more ideal, in my opinion. And following these rules, uh, we have that, that uh, results that you can see here 14 turn scaphoid peronate dislocations operated by uh, Guillaume Herzberg from Lyon. Uh, an expert on these on these uh, injuries. At eight years follow-up, he had an average function of 79%, which is uh, uh, excellent or good in eight out of the 14. Why is that there are so many moderates? Well, because no matter what you do, no matter how good you are at operating these cases, there's a lot of injuries that uh, cannot be solved. Um, that's why uh, the complications, are, I always like to include these two uh, by saying that no matter how, the lunate may have exerted a deep, deep injury to the osteochondral bone of the proximal capitate. In both cases that you can see this, this injury will be difficult to solve because it's exactly where there will be contact between the capitate and lunate. And this is uh, probably the, the worst of, uh, of this injury. Why is that that 25% still in the series of uh, Guillaume Herzberg? Why is that that 25% of perinatal dislocations were missed? Well, because people don't pay much attention to the detail that we have been talking about before. The lunate uh, that it's pointed, has triangular shape, needs to be suspected as a lunate that has been dislocated. And if it is located and you take a properly, um, properly profiled uh, um, lunates, you'll see the typical teacup, uh, spill teacup uh, sign that indicates that the lunate has not been reduced properly. In those cases, what to do? Well, uh, you can uh, opt for many different things. One would be proximal rocopectomy. And in the hands of Inoue and Miura in this, in this paper, they found that 13 breasts with an all unreduced peroneal dislocation, TY proximal rogorpectomy, and followed 11 years, they had quite substantial good results compared to the, to the situation where they were before that uh, was done. And um, now I think that uh, axial dislocations. Axial dislocations uh, were discovered a uh, long time ago, in the beginning of the century, of the 20th century. There was kind of a dislocation that was kind of uh, difficult to understand. 
And uh, why occurred that uh, longitudinal disruption of the carpus that uh, later on we call it axial fracture dislocations? Well, uh, let's review a little bit this, the story about that. Um, as you know, this is a transverse um, view of the distal rock, hame, capitate, opposite, and trapezium are bound to each other like stones in an arch, uh, like stones in a Romanic arch, and um, the, the articulation, the ligaments, intra-articular uh, ligaments, uh, ex-articular ligaments, everything makes these four bones as if this was a very, very solid uh, arch, a very solid bridge. And of course, if you have a, a mild uh, contusion, you cannot uh, have anything wrong, but, but if you have a compressive force applied from the dorsum to the palmar, if the, if the flexor retinaculum is still is there, you have a very, very solid structure. So solid that you need a lot of force to start re-disrupting ligaments. And that's a work that we did some time ago at the Mayo Clinic that uh, we found that there were two, two situations. One situation was the, the capitate trapezoid and trapezium the radial side of the carpus was um, uh, collapsing together, and then the hamate was collapsing towards the other side. And that was what we call the ulnar, um, uh, ulnar axial, axial dislocations, because the, the ulnar part of this, um, this uh, rent was, uh, was uh, creating an instability towards the ulnar side. And that was a dislocation. This case was a dislocation of the hamate. The PC form was following the, that on the side, and the rest of the carpus was uh, fixed or, or was stable relative, uh, relative to the radius. But again, this is a different thing. It has nothing to do with perilunate dislocation. This is most an axially loaded uh, dislocations or disruptions. And uh, obviously, if you have a crash that wrist, or it's a crash or a blast mechanism, the one that has created that, uh, you have a really, really an, uh, a ring uh, completely disrupted uh, a type of injury. This will be the, the ulnar, uh, ulnar carpal, uh, excuse me, the ulnar uh, axial, uh, axial ulnar dislocations, the axial ulnar dislocation where it is, can have different forms. One will be the transhemate peripisiform, another one will be the perihemate peripisiform, and the other one will be perihemate transpisiform type of uh, injury. If instead of having that, um, the, the only part uh, destabilized, if you have that compression in a way that, that destabilizes the radial side, then you have the axial radial dislocations in which we can have affected the trapezium or the trapezoid or whatever, but as long as you induces in, you are inducing in this case an instability of the radial side instead of the ulnar side. Those uh, could be called peritrapezium, peritrapezoid, uh, axial radial dislocations. And this will be another axial radial dislocation that uh, you, you can readily see that there is a disruption of all the ligaments between the distal row and the distal row is never ever more a solid fusion than you had before. Uh, in that case, uh, we have peritrapezoid peritrapezium whenever the second and third, uh, second and first metacarpal follow the trapezium and trapezoid. Then you have the peritrapezium dislocation and the transtrapezium dislocation as well. Those are just the uh, three cases uh, that are, have been seen uh, here and there but it doesn't mean that they are the only ones. They are combined injuries, axial radial and all of these locations as well, and, uh, and so on. Those are the cases that uh, started being uh, amazing because it was uh, Dr. Oberst in 1901. It was the first to realize that there was something funny looking in that X-ray. It was not long after the discovery of X-rays that they found this case and they uh, tried to understand what was going on. And even Niebuhr Meyer in 1908, uh, he found also that axial dislocation is beautiful, very, very, uh, very unusual one. It was a petty triquitrum, petty hemate, axial ulnar dislocation of the wrist. And then uh, um, we followed that and we found many other cases. 
that were published not long uh, after being at Mayo Clinic myself. In 1989, I published this series of patients uh, of uh, 16 patients that were seen with that traumatic axial dislocation of the carpus. Obviously, in those cases, uh, the, least, uh, the least important problem is that uh, dislocation. The more important are the associated injuries, which are usually very, very severe. And uh, these were the, disti the distinction that we made, uh, depending on whether we have uh, left destabilized the ulnar site or the radial site, we had axial ulnar dislocations, we had axial radial dislocations, and we had also combined axial ulnar and axial radial dislocations. Here, another case uh, that you have that, that diastasis between hemate and capitate, and you also have that sagittal fracture of the triquitrum indicating a perihemate transtrapical axial ulnar fracture dislocation. In those cases, it's important to understand that uh, the, what we see in the X-ray uh, doesn't show really what, what happens. Because in this case, um, we have all the hypothenar muscles and all the mass, all the masses that, that are attached to the, to the hemate uh, bone and the, and the pisiform bone, they all displace together. I mean, once you have that, if you uh, reduce that uh, dislocation, everything else will be more or less be left anatomically possible. Uh, completely different in the radial side because on the radial side you have by necessity to have uh, that rupture of the abductor, abductor policies uh, brevis, uh, the both the transverse uh, portion and the oblique portion. And this is why that all those cases have a clinical presentation that uh, comes to you as a, something that uh, really big has happened. And what really big uh, has happened was uh, bring a tap machine or a uh, or a, a power press or something like that. Typically, you have the, these two signs that I think that uh, we should keep in mind or take a home message. First is that the protrusion of the muscle in the first web space. I haven't seen that in many cases, but all of them had some sort of axial dislocation. And then the finger diverging uh, in a malrotation way, uh, it's also a good indication of what we see. Uh, in most of these patients, in this case, will be a case of a uh, uh, capitate, um, capitate uh, axial ulnar dislocation. Another case that uh, you can see that uh, he has the signs of a uh, of that compression of the wrist and, and the the first uh, the first um, space uh, into digital space bursting muscle that is there. And this is something that they should have uh, told us that there was something wrong really here. This is a case that it's interesting. It's Alberto Perez from Chile that uh, allow us uh, to see this. It was a, a case where the Kilula's lines were so much disrupted that we kind of thought that, that there was something wrong. And evident it was wrong because when by just pulling the, the fourth and little finger, we could uh, reduce that capitate and, uh, and the hamate. And you can see that the hamate capitate um, bones are very unstable indeed. And also the, it's like in the Ebermeyer case that we saw before, it's, uh, there is also an, a, a sagittal instability of the, the, of the troequitrum relative to the lunate. This is an axial, uh, only this location, perihemate, Peritriquitum axial on this location. And here you can see how much flattening of the, of the carpal artery is with that uh, yellow arrow indicating that uh, disruption of the, of the cohesion between the hamate and capitate. And this is something that uh, what should not do. Uh, nobody should uh, treat this uh, by just placing sutures on that uh, bursting on the first space. This is creating much, much of a trouble. Uh, this case uh, ended up being badly and uh, it was not, uh, not a good treatment because you should never close what it me it's meant to be uh, a compartment syndrome. That was a compartment syndrome. He ended up having a phenokieto you know, type of compartment syndrome with the palsies of the intrinsic muscles. Uh, you should not either to, to create problems.
problems by others that you don't know where they are. Because this is like in this case, I mean, uh, we should not allow people who doesn't understand the anatomy and the, and the function that uh, they should not start uh, these cases over there at three o'clock in the morning. Those are the cases that need uh, deeper demand, open reduction, of course, but solid fixation. If you can produce a solid fixation with uh, K wires, it's fine. But if not, use the screws or whatever, uh, soft tissue repair. You need to repair everything and do a skin coverage in the right conditions are there. You should do that and always place your K wires following the, the pattern that we said before, that each individual needs to be fixed to its neighbor. And this is the case. In this case, uh, Dr. Alberto Perez, uh, they decided to place our thickness, uh, full thickness skin grafts. And they were very well because uh, they had realized that it was important and they treated very well the case. You can see here that at five, six months, he was doing very well. What about high energy trauma? Um, this is a case that I would like, uh, just it's gonna be a short, short presentation, almost nothing. Just to say high energy trauma. Uh, high energy trauma usually is considered really the most difficult type of, uh, of, things, to, of things to treat. I mean, uh, uh, lots of uh, dislocations, lots of uh, soft tissue damage, uh, lots of uh, problems there. And usually we think that this is um, this is a wall in a sheep skin, and I wonder if you shouldn't look at it as if it was the reverse. This is a sheep in a wolf's clothing. Why is that? I think that we are very keen on the on the idea that everything needs to be stabilized, everything needs to be open reduction internal fixation, immobilization, and allow to heal. And then we believe that with this, we are doing the, the good thing. And then the question is, a high energy trauma what, uh, is characterized by a lot of injury that you don't see, a lot of soft tissue ruptures. Many ligaments are completely destroyed. Not only the bones that, uh, that are visible, are the ones that need to be taken care of. But there is a lot of uh, um, compression, blasting uh, injuries that what they need is just obtain something that can be mobilized right away. Because what would be the most likely outcome after high energy trauma? Obviously it would be stiffness. Very seldom you would have instability. It's so seldom that you have instability that uh, you should not be worried you shouldn't be worried and you should uh, try to exercise as much as a uh, necrotic uh, bone, necrotic uh, soft tissue away to allow to obtain something that can be mobilized right away. How to suspect the case to be high energy trauma? That's a matter of fact, the answer is in the soft tissues. You cannot judge uh, whether the this uh, forest is very big or not, but you can judge by just looking at the soft tissue injuries that may be about that bony injury, capsule incarcerations, control lesions, ligament injuries. If you have that, you know that there is a, a heavy, uh, uh, a high energy trauma. In this case, uh, the, the surgeon was very, very good, uh, did a good job. Uh, however, to me, does this allow early mobilization? Not at all. Not at all, and probably by having decided that, he underwent a very, very difficult procedure, a lot of K wires over there. And my, my question is, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be uh, more concerned about the, the final stability of this? This case is the same, as you can see, an another case with a, a pericapitate. Look at 18 months for surgery, still painful and stiff. I wonder if that case would have been treated much better by just a proximal rocopectomy or something different. In this case, again, another, another perilunate dislocation. We have seen those x-rays before. It was in the end, it was uh, fixed and uh, fixed with, uh, uh, but it was so much, so much damage that uh, we didn't do the good job. 
And I wonder if the, the idea that uh, Dr. Fernandez, Diego Fernandez, uh, wouldn't be uh, acceptable. I think that in those cases, if there is no ligament that you can reconstruct, if there are the, the question is about the future of that, that wrist, sometimes uh, by using the, those, uh, those uh, screw fixations, plus uh, in this case, what he uses is a, a, a ligament, a, a, sorry, a tendon, a stensor capillaridialis brevis tendon or longus tendon is used to reconstruct the ligament. And using those cases, the Russell procedure, which is not, nothing but a fixation that will allow early mobilization. And that early mobilization, why not using it in those cases where there is so much uh, ligament uh, tissue damage that um, in their cases, uh, this is a, a series that he published not long ago. Um, it's a technique that it works. Of course, it's accepting something uh, to start with. It's accepting something that uh, you don't like it as, a, as an urgent uh, treatment. But in this case, for instance, I decided to go to go with a partial fusion right away, the partial fusion of the three corner arthritis in this case. And he was doing so well that I thought maybe I should have been more active uh, from now on in those, uh, in those high energy trauma to produce. And uh, after that, uh, there have been several papers, all of them suggesting that probably there is a place in high energy trauma for early, early, um, um, how would I say, um, salvage procedure, to use the salvage procedure right away, instead of trying to always uh, think that uh, open reduction of sternal fixation needs to be done in all the cases. This case, uh, proximal rubberpectomy was done, and uh, he is him after, not long after this, uh, this uh, case by Dr. Carreño, by the way. He did uh, that proximal rubberpectomy, and the patient is very satisfied and he didn't have to endure the difficulties of uh, that difficult, uh, uh, the, that difficult uh, reductions. So in summary, I would say that uh, these are luckily unfrequent injuries that they are often missed and this is the problem. We should, we should sell, the, sell the idea that uh, this is the first thing we should improve in our practice not to let any of those undiagnosed. Early reduction is okay. Surgery, arthroscopy open, required. Removal of interarticular loose bodies in all of them. Avoid ligament incarceration. Achieve anatomical reduction if you can. Bone fixation and ligament repair or reattaching. Mobilization until the healing is optimal. And if uh, there is a high energy uh, injury, go for a salvage procedure. And that's it for, for, for this. Uh, I do thank you very much for, for your attention.